Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and we are here for my LPL Week 2 overview analysis. And of course, at the end, my updated power rankings. It was a very fun week of LPL action. Obviously, we're just jumping in right before Lunar New Year, so uh, that's going to be a, another little bit of a short week here in week two. Only six series to go over, just like in week one, but that doesn't make any of the series less interesting to talk about. We're definitely getting a pretty good idea of which teams are performing to expectation and which teams might be underperforming to expectation, but of course, if you guys are excited for the video, let me know that down in the comment section below. I love to hear you guys' thoughts and feedback. What was your series of the week? Who was your player of the week? Who was your dead of the week? Let me know all of your thoughts on the LPL right now down in the comment section below. But without wasting too much time, let's go ahead and jump right into the recap. Of course, starting with day number one here on week two. And we kicked off week two with a really fun matchup between Team WE and Edward Gaming, EDG making their season debut, Leave making his LPL debut, I hyped up Leave a lot in the preseason, he's my favorite prospect coming up from the LDL, and uh, he's got a really good team around him, and so it's really interesting to see if EDG is going to be able to uh, transition a lot of that success they had last year into a little bit of a new look roster. Well, in Series 1, it absolutely works out. They win the Series 2-0, they look really, really solid in the series, and it's a lot of the question marks, honestly, for me, that really came to the forefront in this series for EDG in particular. Uh, Fofo was actually going to be getting my player of the series here. He was phenomenal in game two, specifically on that Akali. He was destroying everybody in that game. Hope absolutely couldn't play the game even a little bit. Akali was on that Zeri basically instantly from the start of the game. Those team fights felt basically unwinnable for WE uh, just because Akali was absolutely destroying the backline. You had someone like the Lucian kind of following up. And Nami, honest, Mako on the Nami was honestly terrific as well, especially in the early game being able to generate leads by surprisingly roaming around. You don't often see the Lucian Nami lane break themselves up a bit, but Lee was protected well in this game, and so Mako felt comfortable enough to try and roam around a bit with JJ to create a lot of pressure. He did that both in games one and two on lanes that are pretty typically kind of package deal lanes that you want to see together. But yeah, Fofo definitely going to be my player of the series here. Like I said, the Akali game was great. The Azir game was also pretty good, while I do think uh, JJ and Ale were probably a little bit more impactful in game number one. Fofo was still really solid, and that game two was just devastating good. Uh, I was really concerned about Fofo going into the year. Obviously, he had a, a very down year last year. Couldn't even win the starting job on that BLG team. Eventually replaced by Icon. For him to come in here to EDG, there were a lot of expectations on him. He was honestly the player on the team that I felt the least confident was going to be able to perform once the regular season rolled around. But so far, obviously, one series of sample size. It looks really, really good. If he can get back to that form that he had a couple of years ago on Rare Adam, that's going to be much, much, much better for this EDG team, and it's actually probably going to make them a title contender. They really do have a lot of talent on this team. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to JJ as well. Really good game one on the Vi. Did a really good job going into Hang, who I actually do kind of like what we've seen so far. Uh, I'll kind of skip talking about WE until we get to them, but... Uh, Hang's early games are quite good, so for JJ to be able to keep up and, and, you know, push forward and then obviously just completely outpace him towards the mid to late game, that was very impressive, especially on the Vine game one, but even on the Maokai in game two, a very, very good performance from JJ. And like I said earlier, huge, huge, huge props to Mako, who played really well here on the Lux Nami. Um, like I said, you really don't often see Lux and Nami as these big roam champions, but Mako is so good at these aggressive engages, at pairing up with JJ specifically in the jungle, that creating a lot of this macro advantage for EDG was basically a no-brainer for this EDG team. And so uh, those are the three players that I really think showed out. I want to give big props to Ale as well, especially for game one here on the Fiora, where he was fantastic. It is worth noting game two, a little bit up and down on the Jace. He was doing a ridiculous amount of damage, and he absolutely destroyed Bubu in lane. I don't want to take that away. He was awesome in the 1v1, but uh, the problems that have always haunted Ale had definitely came back to bite him in this series where it felt like, just pushing up too far with no vision, three people collapsing, trying to 1v3 and just dying for no reason in a side lane like six times a game. It's certainly not what you want to see out of a top laner that really does have the mechanics and the ability to be one of the best in the entire world. And he has shown that on an international stage before, but he just has so many mistakes that he has to clean up. In this series, it didn't really matter. EDG was so far ahead and he had that Akali that was always going to be able to team fight really well towards the back half of the game. So... Ole getting picked off in side lanes as the Jace really wasn't that big of an issue, but 
If there is something that I'm concerned about holding this team back at a top level, it could be Ollie's over-aggression and inability to play safe in those side lane matchups. You've also got Leave here, the player that I, I think I noticed the least on EDG, which is fine for your debut on a team that has a ton of experienced talent on it. Leave was hidden very well in these games. He was given the Caitlyn in game one where he could just push forward, not really worry about too much in the early game, and then just, you know, kind of play safe in the late game, allow his Azir, allow his Vi, allow his Fiora to really clean up a lot of these late game team fights. That was good. In game number two, you have the Lucian Nami. Mako uh, roams a lot more on the Nami than you would expect, so the Lucian uh, just has to play safe in the early game. Not really a ton Hope can do, and then in the late game, Hope is getting absolutely blown up. Leave just has to be a consistent form of damage, and they're going to dominate team fights, and that's really what happened. So Leave. You know, as a rookie, you were kind of interested to see what he was going to come in and show in his debut, and he really didn't have a ton of responsibility in this game. I'm not sure if that's going to ramp up as the season goes on, but uh, for now, he was definitely the player that was protected the most, and I think that's probably a good decision on the side of EDG until he gets acclimated into the team. Overall, really good series from them. Not an awful series from WE. Usually when you see two O's, you're like, oh, the other team kind of uh, just wasn't on the same level. I do think there were positives on the side of WE. I think Hang, like I said, his early game was pretty solid in both games, the Maokai in Game 1 and the Vi in Game 2. Uh, I liked the Vi opening a little bit better. I just thought he had a little bit more pressure. The Maokai opening was definitely a little bit slower. Uh, but again, the problems that you know plagued him in their series that they won last week kind of came back to haunt them here as well, where Hang does have a lot of these really good early games, can generate a consistent gold lead or at least a gold neutrality against a very good jungler like JJ, but he doesn't really have an idea of where to transition that lead in the mid game, and that really costs his team a lot. Uh, Shanks, on the other hand, a player that we're, we're just waiting to break out, um, has some good moments, had some bad moments. I actually really did not like his Galio in game number two. You really have to be on the same page as a lot of your team in order for that Galio pick to work, and it just felt like Shanks had a disconnect. There was no damage on this team in late game team fights because Hope was getting absolutely blown up. You pick the Galio, you pick the Vi here to be able to peel for that Zeri uh, in the bot lane, but unfortunately the Akali was just too strong at that point. And there was no peel actually happening. And so once that Zeri was blown up, those team fights were completely and utterly doomed on the side of WE. It made Shanks look very, very, very weak. And so obviously you're still hoping that he can turn that around, that he can still be a productive player, but uh, not a great series in my opinion from him. The bot lane really had no chance. Like I said, there wasn't a lot of pressure in the bot lane early in the games. And so Hope and Awandi really weren't able to generate any sort of lead. And then by the late game, somebody on EDG was super fed, whether it was Ollie in game one on the Fiora, whether it was Fofo in game two on the Akali, that just made Zeri's job so much more difficult. And really Hope and Awandi had absolutely no shot at being able to win it. My dud of the series is going to go to Biu Biu in the top lane. Obviously no shock to people who watch this channel, but he really encapsulated his play style in this series in my opinion. He was going into Ale and Ale's a player that is going to try and take a lot of these advantages at the cost of potentially, uh, you know, his own life uh, as some safety, etc, etc. And Biu Biu just had absolutely no willingness to take advantage of that. He is an aggressive player, but he really doesn't have the hands to back it up. The Aatrox game in game number one, he gets completely run over. The Fiora gets really strong. He can't do anything. And in game number two, even though he is able to pick up some stuff in the late game because they're able to collapse on the Jace multiple times in a side lane, he did get run over in lane as Renekton. And that's just, it's a problem. He is a weak link for this WE team that I think really does want to try and make playoffs. But right now, it's just a little bit frustrating to see that Hope and Awandi sometimes just aren't going to have the same kind of impact that they need. Uh, this is very similar to a situation like Ultra Prime last year, where it was like, this bot lane's good, but how much does it actually matter? Uh, Shanks definitely needs to get on the same page. Hang needs to transition his leads better. And Bubio just needs to do anything other than be a complete liability for this WE team. If it's me, if I'm the general manager of WE, I am looking basically anywhere for a top laner that can come in and just be a stable presence. I, all I need is for you not to be run over in lane, and this WE team is going to be a lot more consistent and potentially even a playoff team. But as it stands right now, Bubio is a problem, uh, not only in lane, but out of lane. And, and I really do think it's going to hold WE back in a major way. So overall, where do I think these two teams stand? Well, WE, uh, you know, it was a 2-0 loss, but it wasn't the worst loss in the world. EDG showed a lot of really good things in this series, so I don't think you can take away, you know, being too disappointed as a loss from WE. Uh, they're not really a team that's supposed to be competing with some of these teams that are trying to make the world championship or trying to make MSI like EDG is. I still think the bot lane is very good, even though they didn't really get a chance to play. I think if Hang can really learn to transition his leads, that team is going to be a lot better in general. But for now, they're just kind of a, a meh, like right on the border of a playoff team. And then for EDG, 
Uh, they really did show a lot of the things I wanted to see them start the season with. Fofo looked really good. JJ looked really good. Lee was kind of hidden, and Ale has the mechanics, right? We always knew Mako was going to be good, and so EDG really showed a lot of the things that I was worried about, and if they keep up this pace, they're probably going to be better than six. This is a team that definitely has the potential to move into that top four, top three situation as the season progresses, and this is a pretty damn good way to start that. Moving on to our second series here of day number one. We had a fun matchup, a top team versus a bottom team, or at least projected, but it's our first look at one of the teams that I'm most interested in seeing in the LPL all year long. It was a series between top esports and anyone's legend. Really, really intrigued to see this top esports finally getting on the rift for the first time this season here in week two. We finally get to see rookie Jackie Love, Tian, Mark, all of them together. Um, Want to point out something a little bit different from my projections. I'm not sure if this is like a full-time thing or if he's just playing this week. Uh, Ching Tian is in the top lane instead of Wayward. I'm not sure if that's going to last. Wayward obviously had a pretty down uh, end of the year. He was really good for most of the year, but uh, towards the back half, he certainly wasn't the most proactive. Uh, people looked at his playoff run and then people looked at his world's run and said that he was a huge liability. Perhaps they are just going to bench him now. Either way, uh, they're starting Ching Tian in the top lane at four now. They did all week long. For AL, looks like Harder is still in. I guess Pins uh, wasn't going to be ready by week two, and so he's probably just going to come in after Lunar New Year. But those are the only two, like, roster moves that haven't really happened yet. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about the series. Uh, TES absolutely brutalized them. I mean, this was not close. TES looked like the better team by a considerable margin. This looked like the number two team in the league versus the number 15 team in the league, which is what, which is what I have them in my power rankings. I, I think TES looked absolutely dominant in this one, and it was really the carry lane duo, the carry roll duo here of Rookie and Jackie Love getting reunited, obviously, two former world champions together on Invictus Gaming. They reunite here on Top Esports, and man, did it look terrifying. I mean, they were just unstoppable in this series. My player of the series is going to go to Jackie Love. I think he was just a little bit more flashy with a lot of his plays, but, I mean, you could give it to Rookie. They were basically together the entire game. I'm going to call them, like, the Skirmish Duo, the Skirmish Brothers. I don't know. Uh, some sort of nick. They have to have some sort of nickname together because they just roam around the map, find someone to kill, kill them, and then take some objective. Like, it, it really is just... It's comical how predictable it is when these two play together. It's what they did in 2018 to win that world championship, and they do it again here. They're just so aggressive and so willing to go and try and take these fights in the jungle, in a lane, you know, 3v3, 2v2, whatever it ends up being, 4v4, whatever it ends up being, they are so willing to try and take these fights because they know that they're going to be able to win them, that it puts the other team at such a huge disadvantage as soon as they lose one fight. Because if TES has any sort of lead, they're going to push it and push it and push it until it's like a 4k, 5k, 6k, 10k, whatever, gold lead, right? Until it's completely out of control. And Jackie Love is a big reason for that. Really good game on the Sivir. Really, really good game on the Zeri. That Zeri was untouchable towards the back half. Obviously, the Yumi... Helps with that a ton. You've got Peel on the side of Cassante and Vi, and then obviously a Victor there as well to deal out a secondary source of damage. But man, he was really just blowing people up. There was absolutely no stopping him in that game. Really, really impressive. Rookie, like I said, was also great. That Azir game in game number one, he was doing a boatload of damage. Azir, Sivir as a combo, especially if they're going to play it ridiculously aggressive, you have to be able to try and match that. And unfortunately, look at the comp on the side of AL. You're really waiting for that Aphelios to get online. You're really not going to be able to skirmish there. The Rise isn't exactly going to be able to match anything that the Azir and the Sivir are doing in terms of damage, especially when you have strong frontline on the side of Sejuani and healing with the side of Yumi. So, I mean, a lot of this was, I'm not going to say just draft, but it's it's better it's a better team with better players and a better team comp winning games. And that's kind of what you wanted to see out of TES. Rookie and Jackie live absolutely dominant. Mark looks good on the Yumi. It's hard to really judge. It's a Yumi game. Two Yumi games, I should say. Tian looks good on these frontline tanks. Obviously, he's going to play relatively aggressive and kind of, uh, you know, maybe, maybe not always be in the right spot. But for the most part, he can get away with it on picks like Sejuani. I really do like that as a... Uh, kind of go-to for TES if you want to just put Rookie and Jackie Love on these two giant damage dealers, whatever they end up being in the mid lane, and then Tian as a more supportive pick, you have something that can either shove out top lane really easily like the Olaf or a, a tank like Cassante in the top lane for whoever's playing there, whether it be Ching Tian, whether it be Wayward, etc., etc., and then Mark just kind of supporting it. I really like this idea from TES, and I think they executed on it really, really well. A dominant, dominant win for them. For AL... 
Uh, yeah, maybe I was a little bit wrong about this team. I felt good about this team going into the preseason. Uh, they're probably going to be my biggest miss of the LPL because holy crap, do they not look good right now. Now, it is worth noting, Harder has been like the biggest problem for this team. Certainly not the only problem, but by far the biggest problem for this team. And he should not be starting past this week. I assume after Lunar New Year, Pins is going to come in. I'm really high on Pins. I actually like him a lot. He's probably the second most hyped player coming up for the LDL for me. I thought he was really good last year for FPX Blaze before he was replaced by Ching, who's obviously on Ultra Prime now. Uh, but I really, I, I think I like Pins more. I think I liked what I saw out of him, and I, I think it'll be interesting to see where they go with him. Harder was a, a disaster in this series. Two picks that are, in my opinion, very suspect. Obviously, the Rise is a strong pick, but not against a team like TES that's going to try and fight you over and over and over again. You need to be able to get numbers advantages for Rise's macro game to be able to work out, and Aphelios is too slow to be able to do that. Maokai's not really going to be able to trade with the Rise early. That 2v2 isn't as strong as it needs to be, and you've got a Cassante in the top lane, so the Rise pick does not work out. And then LeBlanc in game number two. I mean, what, what do we have to do to get LeBlanc out of the meta? She is so weak and so bad right now, and yet people are still picking her. She does literally negative damage, and and outside of that, she has no utility outside of the chain. I just, I don't understand what this pick is for. Uh, people continue to go to it, and it continues to be a problem. So Harder is going to be my dud of the series here, just like he was in week one for AL. But it wasn't just him. Betty and Sword Art continue to not look good as a bot lane, a very passive bot lane in game one. But even on the Lucian Nami in game number two, they get run over because the Zeri Yumi is just looking to fight all the time. That's what Jackie Love and Mark do. And Betty and Sword Art should be in a position where they want to try and trade back. Obviously, you have pretty good sustain in that lane. You really shouldn't be worried too much about taking these more extended trades, but they just don't want to do it. Sword Art especially is just playing way too safe. I really don't like how Sword Art has jumped out to the season. This is something I was really concerned about going into the year, as obviously Sword Art didn't look great the past two years on TSM, or, you know, he didn't really even really play on Weibo. So it was going to be interesting to see how he was going to play on AL, and right now it's looking like the bad version of Sword Art. He's going to need to turn that around if this team wants any chance of being able to push forward, you know, higher than, you know, one of the lower teams in the league. And then ZDZ continues to completely get run over in that top lane. He was nothing in this series. I mean, the Cassante, the Renekton, absolutely nothing. Zhao Hao was fine. Again, got run over by Tian in terms of jungle pressure, but every single one of his lanes lost. So there's really only so much he can do. He is still the best player on this team, in my opinion. I just don't think it'll matter all that much for AL in the long run. So where do I think both of these teams stand? Well, AL is bad. There's really no other way to put it. It's going to be interesting to see if that changes once Pins comes in. Obviously, Betty and Sword Art really need to turn that around. Zhao Hao is a good player, but there's really only so much you can do when there's not a lot of pressure on the map. Right now, it just looks like AL is going to be one of the bottom teams in the league, and there's really not going to be a lot you can do about that. For TES, an absolutely fantastic start to the year. They look dominant. They look like they play the game plan that we absolutely want them to, to play. We all want to see them play aggressive. We all want to see them try and skirmish, and they did that really well here in the first series. Rookie and Jackie Love look like they picked up right where they left off after winning a world championship, and I think you pair that up with some really talented players on this team and Tion and Mark, and then hopefully you can get something stable out of the top lane. TES, uh, we predicted them to be one of the best teams in the league going into the year. It looks like they're probably going to fulfill that potential. Jumping into day two action now here in week two of the LPL. We kicked off day two with a pretty intriguing series here between two teams that are definitely fighting for playoff spots. Two teams that aren't necessarily guaranteed anything, and I was really excited to see how both of them would play in their first series. We had a matchup between Thunder Talk Gaming and LNG Esports, and LNG is able to pick up the nice 2-0 series win here. Uh, not really super surprising. I know a lot of people out there are really high on Thunder Talk. A lot of that is because of the Weibo Cup. Um, you know, they came out and looked really, really good. Yukal specifically came out and looked really, really good in that tournament. He looked better as the year went on, but... I was a little bit more cautiously optimistic about Thunder Talk. I had them just outside of playoffs in my preseason power rankings. As soon as AL proved that they weren't, you know, what we thought they were, they moved back up to number 10 where they probably should have been. But I wasn't like fully in on them. Very similar with LNG. I really like the top end talent that this team has in Tarzan and Scout. Obviously, they're really good. I think Hang is also a very good player, but I was worried about the, the more inexperienced players on the team, Zika and LP, really coming in and being super productive immediately. LP specifically is someone who I was a little bit down on, but LNG comes out here in Series 1 of the year and actually looks pretty good. Now, both of these games were relatively close. It wasn't quite like the last series, which was just a pretty big blowout, I would say, on the side of top esports. This was a close to or closer 2-0, but um, LNG still did a really good job of controlling, I think, the tempo and the pace of the series, and it was really what we expected it to be on the side of LNG. Like, this series was Tarzan and Scout, Looking really good, uh, really pushing forward and really being the ones that kind of 
uh, have all the resources and push LNG into the position to win. Tarzan specifically, I think, was fantastic. Really liked the Zack pick in game number one. Obviously, Tarzan very good at a lot of these engaged style tanks out of the jungle. Obviously, Sejuani comes to mind. Um, but Zack, I think, fits right into that mold as well. I think Zack is a very, very underrated pick in the meta right now. I'm not sure if teams are going to adapt to it because it is kind of volatile and it, it can be taken advantage of by the right team. But uh, I think Zack is a pick that you can definitely pull out in pro play and actually get a lot of work done, especially when pairing it up with things like a Sivir uh, that I think carry a lot of the weight in the late game team fights. Really do like that on the side of LNG and Tarzan did a great job of being able to pilot that. The game one was absolutely terrific. It was the better game, I would say, from LNG. They looked pretty... Uh, unstoppable towards the back half of game number one. Zach and Gages were really big. Scout was doing a really good job maintaining pressure in the side lanes as well as Zika doing the same thing. And LP was doing a lot of damage actually on the Sivir, even though he really wasn't given a lot of responsibility earlier in the game. He was kind of fulfilling that role later with, you know, Tarzan and Hang right there to be able to back him up. But Tarzan was a big reason why they were able to get into a good position in the first place. And then game number two, Definitely more volatile, definitely more skirmish heavy, more fight heavy, and a lot of that was because of how Thunder Talk, how TT wanted to play the series out, but Tarzan did a really good job of being able to maintain expectations there. He was able to get on the Kalista relatively frequently, or the Ash, or the Wukong, or whoever the problem was in a lot of these team fights. Tarzan was doing a really good job of making sure that Vi was there to be able to peel off the, for the Varus, to be able to peel off for the Syndra, and be able to create a lot of opportunities. So for me, Tarzan is going to get the player of the series. I think you could give it to Scout here, who was really good, especially in that game two on the Syndra. He was doing a lot of damage in the late game team fights. He was by far the biggest damage dealer that this LNG team had, and uh, it was impressive. You know, Tarzan and Scout, you really wanted to see them kind of mesh together, and I think at the beginning of this, uh, you know, season, in, in series number one here, they did look pretty good in that respect. I want to give a big shout out to Zika as well. I was actually a little bit lower on Zika going into the year than I think some other analysts were. Obviously, he has the mechanical talent. We've known that for years, but he hasn't necessarily, you know, proven it at an LPL level consistently over his time on Invictus Gaming. Comes over here to LNG or back to LNG, I guess, if you want to say. Gets two games of Renekton into Cassante. That can be a pretty... You know, I don't want to say easy matchup, but uh, Renekton should have a lot of pressure in the early game with that matchup, especially if Zach wants to spend some time top lane, which he did. And uh, Zika took advantage of it. He was actually really important in a lot of these games, creating a lot of advantages for the Syndra and the Varus, especially in game number two. And so uh, I really did like what I saw out of the top side of the map for LNG. That was really the side that I think needed to step up if this team really wanted to impress and kind of come out and beat a team like Thunder Talk that's kind of around them in the standings, around them in talent level. That top side really did need to step up and I think it did in this series. I still am a little bit concerned about the bot lane, not just because they played bad, because I, I really don't think they played bad by any means. I don't think it was perfect. LP was certainly out of position at moments in time. He was caught out, especially on that Varus, a champion with no mobility, can sometimes be put in bad positions. Beishuan did a really good job of taking advantage of that in the early game. We'll get to him in the late game, but in the early game, Beishuan did a good job taking advantage of the lack of mobility on, on a pick like Varus and even a pick like Heimerdinger, but uh, I still think that they're going to be relatively fine. If the top side of the map can play like this, LP and Hang can afford to kind of be a weak side of the map, quote-unquote, uh, and LNG can still win a lot of games. I think if Tarzan's going to control the tempo and the pacing of a lot of these games, then, then I'm not really super concerned with how that's going to play out for them. On the side of Thunder Talk, though, they did show some good things. Uh, unfortunately, they also showed a complete lack of understanding in how to play macro, especially towards the back half of games. I gotta talk about game number two. First of all, very aggressive draft here. The Callista Ash bot lane, obviously, we know can be very, very strong. It can set Callista up to be a really big carry, but they didn't really want to play through it all that much. Yes, Beishuan did try and get on the Varus quite a bit, but it really wasn't to the benefit of... Kalista and Ash all that much. It was more so to the benefit of the Wukong, who they really were trying to feed a lot of this game. Beishuan had a lot of resources going into the mid-game, and then I don't know what happened. I, I, I can't I can't even begin to tell you. It felt like a win trade. I, I, I actually can't begin to tell you what happened to Beishuan. He's going to get my dud of the series because he was so far ahead, and he was the reason his team was in the game. And then he just decides to 1v5 over and over and over and just run it down, like literally ints. Like, there is no other way to put it. You can talk about him, you know, trying to carry the game, perhaps seeing that his team is a little bit behind and trying to make something happen, but that's very different than actively just taking, like, 
zero percent chance win fights like what actual 1v5s like I, you you can't explain to me what was going through his head and it's this is a player that i actually do like and a player that i think has made a lot of strides over the last year has continued to grow and get better the synergy between him and yukal i thought was really good especially towards the end of last year but whatever happened in this series did not work so he's gonna get my dud of the series even though i do think he showed a lot of good flashes in the early game of being able to get a lead being able to get a gold advantage and being able to you know keep up with a player like tarzan who was playing really well he just did such a poor job of any doing anything with it in the mid to late game. He actively lost his team, the series here, uh, with a lot of the plays that he ended up making on that champion. Uh, the other player that I think was kind of a little bit more feast or famine in the series was obviously Yukal. Uh, you can look at him as kind of someone who was following up on a lot of Beishuan's decisions. Uh, not for the better, though. This very much felt like spring split Yukal from last year rather than, you know, end of summer split Yukal that really started to kind of ramp things up. I think that's definitely going to be a concern. This Thunder Talk team did get a lot better as the season progressed last year, but they had a lot of moments last year where they just weren't one of those top teams. I know a lot of people are expecting them to be a team that kind of competes for playoffs. I'm really not super sold on that after this performance. Uh, Beishuan just didn't look like a, the player that he was last year, and Yukal just didn't look like the player he was last year. Obviously, plenty of time to turn around, uh, but it didn't look great. Jin Lu also was caught like over and over and over again. That's kind of been a theme of his career. He really hasn't been a superstar support at any time that he's played on Invictus Gaming. And so to bring him over here and to kind of expect things to change, I really wasn't super stoked about that. I feel bad for Juan Fong. He really couldn't do anything in the series. Um, that's going to be kind of a trend, though, with LPL 80 carries this week is sometimes you're going to lose the game even though you didn't really do anything. And that's kind of what happened to Juan Fong in this series overall. So what does this mean for the two teams? Well, Thunder Talk, you really hoped that they would come out and look a lot better than this. I think I'm not going to punish them too hard just yet because I still think that there is talent on this team and you know LNG it's not like they're a pushover it's not like TT should have easily been able to beat them I would have picked LNG in this series either way but you would have hoped for something a little bit more concrete on the side of Thunder Talk they did a really good job of being able to generate leads in the early game but god their macro decisions towards the back half were just atrociously bad they have to clean that up if they want to be a playoff team and for LNG good start to the year it really wasn't perfect bot lane didn't look sensational but the top side of the map looked good and I think it's a it's a good building block for you to move on I'm not really going to skyrocket them up the power rankings because of this win I don't think they played perfect by any stretch of the imagination a little bit slow for my taste and they were gifted a lot towards the back half of game number two but outside of that they did what they needed to do to win the series and really you know from that standpoint can I really ask for anything else Moving on now to our second series here of day number two, and it was a fun one. You would think it would go one way, certainly did not go the way that we all expected it to. We had Royal Never Give Up taking on Invictus Gaming, and IG with a huge upset here. They actually have their full roster in, which I'll explain in a bit where I got something wrong, but um, Invictus Gaming is looking good. They are looking really really good. They found a diamond in the rough in that top lane. I'm really excited about it. RNG though, whoo, this is not good. I, I will talk about them in a bit, but there are certainly some decisions that this organization needs to make going into the Lunar New Year. Let's talk about IG first. First and foremost, want to talk about where I got something wrong about the roster. Uh, you Should Know Me obviously is in the top lane here with Gideon and Dove both in the team. I had previously stated that that wasn't possible because You Should Know Me was an import. Now, I'm not really sure what exactly happened here, but uh, on Leagueopedia, where I'm sure a lot of you can guess I get a lot of my information, uh, it showed uh, You Should Know Me as an import on Invictus Gaming's page. When you click on his individual page, it does not show him as an import. I'm not sure where the mess up is there. I'm not sure. Obviously, he isn't an import because he's able to play here with both Gideon and Dove, who are also imports, but uh, that one was my bad. Obviously, he is able to play in the top lane, and that does increase the floor of Invictus Gaming and, and the ceiling by quite a bit. Uh, really, really excited to see this team finally get their full five together with Dove being able to come in here. And man, did it look good. Starting in game number one, this was a solo lane dominance. Uh, you should know me on Jax. I, I really don't see why you're going to be able to give him this champion. Over the course of the year, he looked unbeatable against a really good top laner in Breathe on a very stable pick in Cassante. He was able to jump out to an enormous lead and then really was just able to take over the entire game. Wei had literally negative pressure this entire series and a lot of that was just because if he tried to go anywhere and the Jax was there, it was game over. Uh, Gideon in game number one on the Maokai with that point and click CC 
I mean, it was basically just done. And then I want to give a big shout out to Dove in game one as well on the Kassadin, who was doing a ridiculous amount of damage. Dove's first game in the LPL, he looked dominant. Like, he looked like one of the best LPL mids in the game. Obviously played top lane last year for Live Sandbox, almost made Worlds, but was the weak link of that Live Sandbox team. And I'm not going to say the only reason they didn't make Worlds, but was one of the bigger reasons they weren't a team that was, you know, making the World Championships. He moves back to his native mid lane position here for Invictus Gaming, and he looked fantastic in game number one on the Cassidy. Game number two was also spectacular. Uh, you're looking at On and Wink mostly in game number two and that Lucian Nami. You start to wonder when they're not going to be able to start getting this bot lane because... They have really proven that they have practiced this lane extensively over the course of the offseason. On looked destructive on this Lucian. He was doing a lot of damage, and Wink was fantastic on the Nami being able to enable that as well. But Yushin Nomi was still great. They gave him the Jax again in game number two, and he dominated on that. Yushin Nomi is going to be my player of the series. It's not going to surprise a lot of people. That's two wins for Invictus Gaming. That's 4-0 and for Invictus Gaming, and that's two player of the series for Yushin Nomi. In the top lane, we could be seeing the emergence of one of the break out stars of the LPL here in 2023. He looks unbelievable. IG did a fantastic job to scout and realize that this guy could really be a difference maker at the LPL level basically immediately. I liked his tape, but I didn't know he had this in him basically, you know, from day one. You bring him in here. He works really well with the rest of this team. The bot lane has completely transformed on and Wink, who were by far, in my opinion, the worst bot lane in the LPL last year. I don't even think that is really all that disputable. They were a travesty last year, have been really good in their first four games here in the LPL. Hopefully that can stick. They're playing, yes, against a bot lane that, you know, maybe wasn't all that strong in this series in particular, but still, uh, you gotta be excited to see if On and Wink can continue their pace. Dove looked fantastic in this series, especially on the Cassidy in game number one, but even on the Silas in game number two, he still looked really good. And then Gideon, if he's your weak link and he's still going to be a CC bot on a lot of these tanks, that is a fantastic composition. IG could, like, actually be a playoff team right now. You should know me looks like an MVP contender to start the year, and the solo links look good, the bot lane looks good. This is just about everything you could have possibly wanted to see from an Invictus Gaming team in this series. As for RNG, disaster. <laughs> I mean, really, not, not a lot of good things here. Obviously, you're, you're not really looking at your full lineup here. Tong Yuan is still in in the mid lane instead of Angel, who's not going to be back until after Lunar New Year because of squad registration rules. You also still have Bunny in the support position. He is your quote-unquote starter, but as I think we've learned from this series, God, RNG should really just do whatever they have to to get Ming back here, obviously. He's holding out. RNG is contract jailing him, and he's like, screw you, I'm not going to play for you. I want money. Like, if you're going to, if I'm going to play for you, you're going to have to pay me. You know, props to Ming, honestly. I think he's doing the right thing. RNG has screwed over so many players as an organization in the past. Uh, you got to give props and credit to Ming for not being one of those players here, but uh, at some point, RNG as an organization is going to have to bite the bullet and bring him back because Bunny was atrocious in this series. A very easy choice for dead of the series. He was bad, and I mean like unplayable bad. Uh, his Ash in game number one, while it wasn't like awful, awful, was certainly not good. Got completely run over by the Lucian Nami. Caitlyn Ash, by the way, what are we doing? Like, what what, what are we doing here? Um, and then game number two, I mean, there's the, the, the karma play where he gets, he walks up, gets bubbled, gets full comboed, and then basically forces his jungler and AD carry to die as he recalls and loses the lane for his team. Um, I mean, just, he does not look like he can play at an LPL level. And this is not a team that is like, oh, well, maybe give him some time to develop. You're not really trying to win right now. This is RNG. Like, they want to make worlds. He cannot be this bad if this team does want to make worlds. Like, you have to find someone else if he is going to play like this, because it was a Atrocious. This might be the single worst performance of the year so far. Uh, it was really, really bad. Tong Yuan also just got completely run over by Dove in the mid lane. He was a complete negative on the Syndra pick that I think is very strong in the meta right now. Obviously, Kassadin is also incredibly strong and does a really good job of being able to get on Syndra if she's already used her W, but... Uh, outside of that, like, Tong Yuan just has to play better. He has to be able to do a lot more in team fights. His synergy with Wei is, like, negative. Wei was garbage in this series, and that's something I'm a little bit worried about. I've always been a little bit lower on Wei, I think, than consensus. I think last year, you know, kind of caught me up. I thought he had a really good 2022, but he's kind of becoming what I thought he was in 2021 again, which is just a good player, not a great player. Uh, he definitely got a little bit... Uh, out pressured. I'm not going to blame it entirely on him. His his top and his mid were both losing pretty hard. Even his bot lane was never really in a position to win. And so it's hard for me to blame him entirely. But man, he did not have a good series. And then Breathe in the top lane. Someone who's like relatively stable for most of the time. Uh, had some good moments, especially on the Fiora in game number two. But 
you should know me just outplayed him. Like, there really is no other way to put it. This is a top two or three, you know, top laner in the region, and you should know me just absolutely obliterated him in lane, and so that's a really, really good look if you are IG. Overall, where do I think these two teams land after this? Well, RNG, like I said, is, I don't want to say they're going to be in full panic mode because they won their first series two to nothing uh, against a pretty good OMG team, at least in my opinion, and so you're not going to freak out too much right now, but this is not a good loss, especially the fact that Bunny looked so completely inept uh, he was on Yumi in both of the games in their first series. He gets taken off of a pick that can be really, really safe, basically with no consequences. Has to actually play the game and looks really, really bad. And so uh, that's definitely a concern. There is a chance that he is just simply one of, if not the worst support in the LPL right now. You've got to get Tong Yuan out of there. Fortunately for them, it's probably his last series uh, on the main roster this year. Angel should be back after Lunar New Year. Outside of that, uh, it's really hard to judge everybody else on this team until we get the full lineup in. So I'm taking a little bit of a wait-and-see approach on RNG, but definitely pulling the panic button basically already on Bunny, who just does not look like he can play at this level. And then for IG, holy crap, this team is surprisingly good. I had them as awful going into the year. I had them as the worst team in the league going into the year, mostly because I didn't know You Should Know Me was going to play in the top lane. I, I thought he was an import, and so I didn't think they had room for him on this roster. I certainly didn't expect Dove to come in and play like this, and I most certainly didn't expect this bot lane to come in and play like this. They look really, really good right now. If they can keep that up, that's going to be fantastic. IG really could make a push to be a playoff team if they continue to play like this, and I really don't think it's that big of a stretch to say that. That's going to bring us to our third and final day of LPL action. We got two more series to cover, and we kicked off day three with an intriguing series here between Billy Billy Gaming and Fun Plus Phoenix. BLG picks up a really strong series win here, two to one. Obviously, they went into this series projected, projected, projected as favorites. I'm not cutting that out. That's funny. Uh, projected as favorites and uh, they were able to capitalize. They they did everything they needed to do to win this series. They win game one pretty handily off the back of Elk just getting super fed on the Lucian. They lose game two, but mostly it was just because they failed the Cassidy in check. Cassidy hit that level 11, was able to take over the game. Care actually played really well this entire series. We'll get into that. And then game number three was just a team win. Bin looks really good in the top lane. Yigao looks really good in the mid lane. Elk looks really good at AD carry, even if June was kind of running it a bit, especially towards that third game. Uh, let's get into it, though. For BLG... Player of the series for me is going to go to Elk in the bot lane. Elk obviously joining a good team again after uh, a 2022 with Ultra Prime that went about as disastrously as it possibly could have for him as a player personally. After a really good 2021 on that WE team, he finally gets teammates around him again, and he looks pretty good. Him and On seem to have really good synergy together as a bot lane. It seems that a lot of LPL teams are just perma-practicing Lucian Nami. I don't blame them. It is a really strong bot lane, and it will probably continue to be a really strong bot lane basically until the end of time. Uh, and it really does look like Elk and On look incredibly efficient on that. Obviously, LWX and Lele opting into the Zeri Yumi trade every single game. Not an awful trade, I think, in a draft perspective. I think I personally slightly prefer Lucian Nami, just because I think it gives you a little bit more power in the early game. You know, depending on what you want to do, it, it gives you a little bit more onus out of the bot lane to be able to win. But depending on the team that you have around you, sometimes Zeri Yumi can be kind of just an auto-win button by the late game. That's kind of what we saw in game number two when you paired that with the Cassidy, pair that with, pair that with the Cassante on the top side, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But... I uh, really do like what I saw out of this bot lane. Elk looks great. On looks fantastic on the Nami. I think that bot lane is really, really clicking. And if they can continue to do that, this is going to be a top team. Uh, Elk is incredibly talented. And I think we're really starting to see it again here in 2023. Then you got the mid-jungle duo that I actually think was a little up and down this series. Um, I'm seeing a lot of hate for Yigao across the internet. I don't really understand uh, why he's getting so much hate. Uh, Yagao is a very, very good player who is probably the best supportive mid laner in the world. I mean, you can make a case for that. I mean, certainly. Uh, I, I don't really understand why people are like, this team is really talented if they can just get a good mid laner. I think they have a very good, like a world caliber mid laner. Uh, so I, I don't really know. Yagao was really good in the series, especially on that Syndra in game number three, where he was doing a ton of damage towards the back half of these fights. Obviously, the Lucian Nami was able to generate quite a bit of lead, but uh, you have a lot of peel on the front line. You really need that Syndra to step up for a lot of these late game team fights. They're a very tanky comp that you have to break through on the side of FPX. And you know what? Syndra did that. Like, he did a really good job of being able to play that, staying safe in fights, being able to deal his damage. Yagao was really good. I, I don't understand why. 
there's this prevailing na- narrative that he is the weak link of this team. I think the weak link of this team, in my opinion, is pretty clear after this series, and that is Jun in the jungle, who, yes, he certainly had his moments. He did a good job of being able to set his teammates up, most specifically, of course, Elk and On, but man, was he just not good in some of those engages in game number three. Uh, Jun has always had a pretty major problem, which is team fighting in the late game. He always has had pretty good early pathing. We've talked about this a bit with a lot of LPL junglers, um, that he has good early games and he's able to set up the game relatively well, but finishing off games has always been a little bit of an issue for Jun. That certainly has not changed. Actually, some of his team fighting in this series was abysmally bad, like like almost dud of the series worthy bad. Uh, he didn't play bad enough for me to give it to him. Uh, BLG was, you know, a, a kind of a cohesive team, and so it's hard for me to sit here and be like, June deserves dead of the series, but I do think that there is a pretty solid argument that June made by far the biggest mistakes of anybody in this series, and so definitely need to see him start to get a little bit more consistent out of that jungle position. I, again, I'm going to reiterate this. If you're not one of the top junglers in the league that has really, really solid macro and can dominate the early game and the late game, don't pick Vi. Like, Vi is just not a champion that is going to enable a lot on the team unless you're, like, actively just better than the other team, and so... Uh, again, I don't really want to see this pick continue to be as high a prio as it is. I think it's over-prioritized by a considerable margin in the LPL right now. It'll be interesting to see if that adjusts. And then Ben was fine. Really didn't have to be all that great. A lot of the attention was on the bot lane in this series. So BLG looking good. FPX, on the other hand, not looking awful. Uh, Care specifically looked great in this series. I actually think Care showed that he is pretty ELO stuck in this series. He was really good in their first series as well that they weren't able to win, but he got the castle win in game number two. He was able to hit that level 11 power spike, and then he just completely took over the game from there. Him and Howie actually had a fantastic jungle mid synergy in that game number two. The Wukong Cassidy and combo can be really difficult to stop if you don't really have a lot of peel, and a lot of the peel was really on June in that game where he was really, really garbage at making sure that Elk and Yagao had time and space to be able to fight in the late game there, and so Care was actually able to just completely take over how you did a really good job of setting him up but the other games really not so great I'm actually seeing a lot of love for LWX across the internet right now I think LWX is in a really big slump and yes he's an incredibly talented player that we know can be one of the better AD carries in the league and in the world because he has been in the past but he has not really shown it over the past six months or so and it's not really come out at the beginning of this year either he almost got my dead of the series for me it was actually really difficult to choose a dead of the series I don't think anybody on FPX played like really, really bad. I think LWX certainly had moments where he was out of position, but he was also targeted immensely on the side of BLG. I think for me, I'm going to give it to Xiao Laohu in the top lane because he really just accomplished nothing in this series. Two games at Cassante couldn't peel for absolutely anybody, and then a game three on the Gwen where he had literally negative impact on the game, and so for me, I'm going to give it to him even though he didn't do anything like atrociously wrong, just because I think, you know, there really wasn't a better target for me on FPX. I do think you could theoretically give it to LWX, but... I do think he had some moments, and it's not entirely his fault that the enemy team is just like, I'm going to go after you over and over and over again. And so, you know, frustrating series for FPX, but Care showing some development. Uh, that It's certainly going to be uh, something to monitor. Care looks like he could potentially be a top mid laner in the league one day. Unfortunately, it looks like he's a little bit ELO stuck on FPX as it is right now. And then Haoya actually looked uh, pretty good in this series, in my opinion. Better than I expected him to. Him versus Jun, I really don't think there was that big of a difference in the junglers in this series. Botley needs to be better. That's really what I got to say for FPX. Botley just simply has to be better. LWX has to get back to that form or else FPX is just not going to be a playoff team. Uh, and then Lele's got to be, you know, something. Like right now he's just playing Yumi and the bot lane's losing and nothing's really happening. Uh, same with Xiao Lao who has never really been anything in the top lane. Honestly, it's just been kind of a, a stem the bleeding type of player his entire career. When he was given opportunities last year, he was that. Uh, and that's really carried over into 2023. So uh, not a lot of expectations for FPX. And I think that kind of came out here. Just a little bit of an ELO trap jungle mid duo. And then for BLG, I actually really like this. I, I really like the series. Elkanon look fantastic. If they can continue that, they're going to be one of the best teams in the league. Yagao is still going to be a criminally underrated mid laner. He's still going to be very good. He can carry games. He carried game number three in terms of damage on that Syndra. He's not just this player that has to play Galio every game, even though he played the Galio fantastic at game number one. If you do have a question mark about BLG, it's June, and you're really hoping that he can clean up a lot of these late game decision making, a lot of these late game team fight mechanics. Uh, but, you know, outside of that, I think this team just has so much talent that they're probably going to be able to run over at least a lot of the worst teams in the league. It's just about whether or not they have the stability and the complete package to be able to compete with some of the best teams in the league. 
That's going to bring us to our final series of the week here in week number two. And it was definitely an interesting one. I mean, this is a top of the table clash. And I think this is really going to give us some insight as to who the best teams at the beginning of the year are really looking like. As we had a matchup between Weibo Gaming and Top Esports. Two teams that I rank very highly 4-2 and two, respectively. And Weibo with a massive series win here. They actually looked really good in this series, and I think this gives me a lot of confidence that this team really has the talent to be a team that could potentially challenge to win the league this year. Let's go ahead and go over why I think that. Well, first and foremost, it's really hard to talk about the series without talking about the player who impacted all three games by far the most, for good and for bad, in game number two, and that is Karsa in the jungle. It's a player who had a really down 2022, obviously came into a Victory 5 team that was really looking to compete and contend, and there really were some problems. Obviously, he came out and looked okay for most of the year, but really didn't look fantastic. There were rumors of behind-the-scenes drama and turmoil. He ends up getting replaced towards the back half of the year with Xiao Bao, who comes in as just a different style, and he goes back here to a different team in Weibo Gaming, pairs back up with a player like Xiao Hu, gets a ton of aggression in players like The Shy, players like Crisp in support, who are really willing to kind of run and try and fight and play with him. And uh, you know what? In series number one here for Weibo, it looks like it works. Carson, game number one was fantastic on the poppy. Really was able to take over the game, but game one, in my opinion, was more so Zhao Hu playing really, really well on the Syndra. He looks like he is going to really emerge. I got a lot of pushback for putting Zhao Hu as the number two mid laner in the LPL going into 2023 in my preseason player rankings, but... Man, Zhao Hu's just a good player. Like, I feel like he does everything at a very, very high level. And maybe he's not the most consistent player in the world. Maybe he will have some down games. But when he is on, and he's on probably 85 to 90% of the time, like, he's really only bad probably 10% of the games. When you get that 90% roll on Zhao Hu, he's just one of the best players in the world. Like, he actually is. We saw that in game number one. His pairing with Karsa looked fantastic in that game one. Game number two, certainly not a great showing for Weibo. Karsa completely runs it on the Viego. A really bad performance from him. But uh, you got to give credit where credit's due on the side of TES. Jackie Love and Mark doing a really good job being able to push their lead in the bottom lane on that Lucian Nami. Another pick that we're seeing just consistently win here in the LPL. They were able to push that. Rookie did some good damage in the late game on the Azir and they were able to take game two. But game three, back to normal. Kars actually pulls out the Elise, a pick that I expected to see a lot more in pro play than we're actually seeing. I think it's relatively strong right now. And I think being able to generate those early leads, especially pairing it with a bot lane like the Caitlyn Lux, where you really can just push it push it, push it. Uh, I, I think that was a really, really good showing overall from Weibo. I really like this draft, and I think they played it well. Kars is going to be my player of the series. He really controlled the tempo in both of the wins and was the biggest reason why Weibo came out of the series on top, in my opinion. But big shout-out to Zhao, who was really, really good in that first game and in the third game on the victor. I, I really think he had a good series. And you got to give a shout-out to the Shy. He pulls out the AD Nidalee top in game number two. I would not expect anything else from the Shy in the first series of the year. And while it may not have worked, we're certainly going to see it in solo queue. He looked really good in game number three on the Cassante with something a little bit more uh, controllable. I actually thought he played that matchup really well. He absolutely destroyed Ching Tian in game number three. So that top side of the map looking really solid. Light and Crisp looked really good in game number three. On the Caitlyn Lux, I really think that's a good duo. And overall, if Light and Crisp are the two players that you're kind of moving away from towards the beginning half of the game, uh, that's a really, really strong weak side. And so, really, really like the construction of Weibo overall as a team. And honestly, I think they played really, really well in this series. Mostly Karsa, who again, is going to be my player of the series. And also, shout out to Xiao, who I think he's underrated, somehow. Uh, top Esports, on the other hand, on the other side... Uh, had some moments. Jackie Love looked really, really good, I think, in this series. His mechanics continue to just shine through. Him and Mark have a fantastic duo together, and I think Jackie Love is really showing that he's one of the best AD carries in the world right now. Unfortunately, not all of his plays are going to work. In game number one, he flashes forward on the Lucian. If he's able to completely blow up that Syndra before that fight gets underway like he tried to do, uh, I think TES wins that game, probably. It's a very close margin. Unfortunately, it's just not able to go that way. He ends up getting blown up, and from that point onwards, the game is basically over. Uh, rookie also in game number one had a chance to be able to do something on the Cassidy. I always talk about how if you hit that breakpoint on the Cassidy, especially with a player like Rookie, the game is probably over. But uh, Weibo Gaming were definitely prepared to play against that in this one. And so uh, they weren't able to get to that. In game number two, Jackie Love really popped off. I mean, this Lucian Nami lane just goes absolutely hard. And, and, and Jackie Love played really, really well. Big credit to Mark as well on this Nami. Uh, we've seen a lot of players play Nami at a 
an interesting level, not really a super like ridiculously high level. Mark is one of those players that I think plays this champion absolutely phenomenally. Him and Jackie Love just are the lifeblood of top esports right now. Rookie's playing well in that same vein, but topside continues to be an issue, which we saw in game number three. Ching Tian's going to be my dud of the series here. He got completely run over on the Jacks in game number three. Certainly wasn't good on the Aatrox in game number one. Not really a pick that I would really want to see a lot of teams go to. I think you could realistically also give dud of the series to Tian in the series who wasn't all that good. Um, this is my concern with Tian is when he does get behind, when he plays, you know, junglers that are really good at being able to control the tempo and can get out to an early lead. He really hasn't been all that efficient over the past few years, even though he won MVP last year. Um, you know, obviously I certainly had thoughts about that, but topside might be a little bit of an issue for TES. We talked about this going into the season. Top lane is a little bit of a black hole for this team. Wayward was a problem for them at Worlds. They were, he was probably the biggest reason they weren't able to get out of groups. Obviously not the only reason, but certainly probably the biggest. You're trying to replace him, I think, here with Ching Tian. He comes in and just isn't that guy. Uh, clearly, this position is still a position of weakness for this top esports team. And if I'm going to rank them as number two in the power rankings, if this is going to be an S-tier team that is really trying to win the World Championships, this top lane position has to be figured out. Right now, teams with really strong top laners that are willing to to play aggressive and willing to get resources like the Shy can really take advantage of a weakness in that position. And then again, Tion really isn't a jungler that plays all that well from behind. You're really going to need to start stepping up your early game tempo. I want to give a shout out to rookie Jackie Love and Mark because I do think that they are starting the year off on a really good foot. It's just that top side of TES that really makes me worry. So where do I think these two teams land overall? Well, top esports definitely needs to gain some consistency. Like I said, you've got to figure out what's going on in that top lane. If you can get anything out of those two, the rest of this team really is playing well enough to be one of the best teams in the world. But Right now, uh, it's just the consistency that really bothers me for this team. And while it's not the worst loss in the world, you would have hoped that they would have been able to take this series against Weibo. For Weibo, this is exactly how you wanted to see your season kick off. You're playing a very good top esports team, and honestly, you just skill check them. Carso looks great if you're getting the best version of him, even if it is a little bit coin flippy like it was in game number two. That's still going to be a massive positive for this team. Xiaohu looks like Spring Xiaohu. What can I really say? That's the best version of him. The Shy looks like an aggressive version of himself, but actually has teammates that I think are more consistent and willing to back him up. And then Light and Crisp are always going to be solid on the bot side of the map. So overall, about as good of a start to the year as you could ask for Weibo. This could absolutely be a team that contends for an LPL trophy by the end of spring. All right, that is going to do it for my LPL 2023 Spring Split Week 2 overview and analysis. Up on the screen right now, you are going to see the updated LPL standings after Week 2, of course, going from 1 to 17. Teams in the top 10 on the left, teams in the bottom on the right, uh, so we can kind of separate where people are in the playoffs right now. Obviously, very few games played. This is going to be... Uh, ever shifting as the season goes on. But let's go ahead and talk about my biggest risers and followers in my power rankings, which you can see in the first column next to the teams, the power ranking column. Let's go ahead and talk about the biggest risers and the biggest followers. Well, the biggest riser this week, no surprise to a lot of people, it's going to be Invictus Gaming. They go up from number 14 to number 10. They are now in my projected playoffs for power rankings. This is not a team that is just winning games. This is a team that is winning games decisively against a good team like RNG. Yes, they're not perfect. They certainly have some players that maybe aren't playing up to expectations, but they're beating the good players too. It's not like Breathe and Way and Gala are playing out of their minds and just losing the game, right? Invictus is actively being better than Royal Never Give Up right now, and that gives me the confidence that this team is a lot better than I was expecting. In the first two weeks, this team has now gone from 17 to 14, and then from 14 to 10. Very, very good start to the year for IG. I hope they can keep it up. Another big riser that I want to talk about this week, Weibo Gaming, going up from number four in my power rankings to number two. They jump up to number two by beating top esports. This looks like one of the best teams right now. Obviously, a lot can happen in the season. This is the most volatile team in the league, but when they are clicking, they are a top two, potentially top one team in the league, and that definitely showed this week. That means top esports falls. And that's also a nice segue into my uh, biggest faller this week, which is going to be RNG. Uh, they fall from number three in my power rankings to number six, all the way down. BLG jumps them, obviously. Weibo jumps them. EDG jumps them. They are now falling 
fast. They are still going to stay in the A tier because I think I really do want to see what this team looks like once they get Angel back. But if this team does not figure out a way to make that support position a little bit better, I'm not really sure this is going to be a team that is competing for a title in the LPL right now. So they fall to number six. Obviously, a bunch of other changes, some teams rising, some teams falling uh, with, you know, some teams moving up and down. Most of it is just, um, you know, s subsidiaries of that. But the other one is that uh, I actually, a little bit of a correction from last week, OMG is going to fall down two spots uh, and, and Nip and LNG are actually going to jump above them. They fall down to number nine, still in that, you know, B tier of teams. I still think they're going to be good, but uh, I think uh, NIP and LNG are probably a little bit more experienced right now, and I'm going to give them the nod in terms of power rankings. They're not far apart, though, so that's going to bring us to my player of the week and my dud of the week here in week two. Always a little bit difficult to give these out in the shortened weeks because most of these teams are only playing one series, but... My player of the week in the LPL in week two is going to go to You Should Know Me on Invictus Gaming. I mean, how can I give it to anybody else? He has been the star of the season so far in the LPL. He is absolutely deserved player of the week. He looked fantastic. Really just looking like a better player than Breathe in his series against RNG, which is definitely not what I expected going into it. And my dud of the week, unfortunately, is going to be in the same series. It's going to go to RNG. It's going to go to Bunny, who just looks completely outclassed right now as the support for RNG. So you should know me. It's going to be my player of the week for week two. And Bunny is going to be my dud of the week for week two. Hopefully... Uh, you should know me can keep that up. I'm really excited to see where he can go from here. And then hopefully Bunny can either figure it out or RNG is going to really have to look in and see if they can beg Ming back into that roster. So that's going to do it for my week two analysis. Let me know what you guys thought down in the comment section below. Do you agree with my analysis? Do you disagree? Who's too high in my power rankings? Who's too low? Let me know all of that down in the comment section below. Of course, if you enjoyed the video, feel free to throw it a like. It really does mean a lot to me. It shows me you guys are enjoying the content. And of course, if you're new here, hit the subscribe button. I put out weekly review content, not only for the LPL, but for all four of the major regions, as well as the NACL all year long. So if you're interested in that kind of content, hit that subscribe button. I'm putting out a ton of videos this year, just like I did last year. So with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day and I will see you all later.